My name is Laura Fair, and I'm the Statewide Education Rights Director with Public Council Law Center. And we um, run and operate the Fixed School Discipline uh, website, and we depend on actually the expertise of many of you who are, have joined us today and many others to help share information about what's happening around the state and, and really with the goal of trying to create a real network of folks who are interested in figuring out how to fix school discipline issues in their in their schools and working on alternative solutions that not only improve student behavior but also help improve attendance and academic achievement. And so today we're really going to focus on the local control accountability plan and we are very fortunate to have also with us Jasmine Jones who is an organizer with the Black Organizing Project and she's going to share from a community perspective um, what um, the Black Organizing Project is doing around the local control uh, funding formula and local control accountability plan in Oakland and some of the ways that the community is getting involved in trying to um, ensure that the school climate priority is it has elements that the community feels very strongly about. So I will turn this presentation over to Jasmine in about 30, 40 minutes and she will take it over and then we will have time at the end for questions. Um, so, but if you have a question while I'm talking, feel free to um, send me an, uh, a little uh, text and you can send it through the chat button there as you all are probably familiar with. And I will um, most likely will wait till the end to answer all the questions just for the ease of the presentation. But if there's something that is, you know, really seems pressing as I'm going along, I will send it around to all of you. So let's get started um, because now we're a few minutes over and hopefully folks um, who will join, who've just joined us um, will be able to follow along. So obviously we, we, we have a first opportunity here this year. This is the first time in the state that our financing regime includes specifically a requirement to look at school climate and address it through the budget process and in a local control accountability plan. Um, and before we get started with what that looks like and, and how we can you know, all participate in making that real for young people, I want to just go really quickly about why, why school climate should be an issue of, of importance to all schools. Um, and I am, you know, I'm a, an education rights attorney. I've worked in many, many schools and worked with uh, students throughout the state on various issues. And what I saw very clearly um, in my work was that if we can't get school climate, if we can't actually reach young people who are struggling with behavior, then they really can't learn. Um, and so this is really fundamental in terms of uh, what we need to do to reach some of our, our students who are struggling the most. And if we, you can see in California that we have uh, an issue. Um, we have this year, we've, we've done some, some of the amazing work actually of some of the people who are on this call today. We have re started reducing suspensions in the state and we're seeing academic achievement gains as more and more young people are, are kept in class and kept in school. So we have here um, 609,000 plus suspensions were recorded just this year. Um, and 43% of all those suspensions are for willful defiance and disruption. Um, probably many of you know, but there are 24 um, categories for which young people can be suspended, and willful defiance disruption is just one of those. But it accounts for a huge portion of the suspensions in the state. We last year had um, 8,000, in 2012, 2013, had 8,564 expelled students who were tracked by the state. And we had over 300,000 students um, suspended, so some of those were suspended more than one time. What we see that's really troubling is disproportionate discipline, particularly for our African-American young people. So they make up about 6.5% of our total enrollment, but even though we've seen a reduction in suspensions, they're making up 29.7% of the suspensions in the state. And what's interesting and in, in what we find in the national data, um, if you can see here, is that it hasn't always been this way. Um, we have seen over time since the 1970s a real increase in suspensions and the risk of suspension for students, um, all students, and then by race. If you look by race, you can see that the risk is far higher for our students of color in terms of being removed from the school. Um, this is also some data that shows us a bit more about what it looks like. This is older data from 9-10, um, but it, it still shows what you can see here in terms of um, students and the suspension rates, and particularly here, African-American Male students in our secondary schools have really our highest rate of, of suspensions in the state. 
And then if we look at, again, uh, the data for this year, we can see that there's really a difference when we look at our serious offenses and when we look at disruption and defiance. And, and as advocates, we are very concerned about disruption and defiance because it is very subjective and it's low-level offense. And what we want to see is more of our young people who are struggling with this getting the types of alternatives that we're going to talk about a little bit later um, in, in the presentation. But you can see that there's a big gap that if there's, for African-American students, the gap triples, basically, when you look at our disruption and defiance suspensions in terms of their risk of suspension. So we have great disproportionality in terms of uh, suspensions for our African-American students. Now, the question obviously is, well, is this really a bad thing, right? Does this matter um, to academic achievement, to student outcomes? And what the studies have really shown us is that um, the impact is significant. First, we know that suspensions increase the risk of dropping out, that a student who is suspended is two times as likely to repeat a grade, um, that a student who is suspended is three times as likely in the same year to have contact with our juvenile justice system. And anecdotally, for the young people that I work with, and so do many of you, you know that when we send young people home, that oftentimes they're going home to an unsupervised household. You know, um, many of my clients are, have single-parent single, single parent families who have to work, and they can't miss work um, in the jobs they're in. If they do, they can often get actually fired from those jobs. And so my clients would sometimes, when they were home, they would be home all alone, um, and the coroner would be calling, and the likelihood of them getting in more trouble or being victimized was very high. Um, we also see that when a student is suspended, that actually it, it doesn't actually, uh, there's not any research to show that it actually reduces the likelihood of behavior, and, and in fact, it can repeat that behavior it can, and result in some repeat. And then the question also, larger question, right, is that I always hear sometimes people say, well, we, want, we don't want to see, you know, obviously one bad student messing it up for the rest of the students, right? And the question then becomes, well, is suspension actually it, the, the punishment of suspension itself, right? We know we need to hold students accountable, but is this actual punishment, suspension, working to actually make our school safer? And there's very little support that it does. In fact, um, the states with the higher suspension also have our lower academic achievement scores, that our higher suspending schools also have the below average test scores, even when they're compared with um, scores of demographically similar schools. And what, what the research does show is that actually the best predictor of the safety and quality of, a, of um, a school site's school climate is actually the relationships inside the building. And many of the strategies and alternatives we're going to talk a bit about today that some of you are already implementing in your school site, really at formative basis, it's about relationship building through different mechanisms and strategies. And it's about creating that safe and quality uh, of culture and relationships on, inside the building. So again, the high rates of suspension, they are correlating with our lower academic achievement scores, and even when we're controlling for race and poverty. And that suspended and expelled students six times more likely to repeat a grade in a Texas study, so even higher than um, you know one would think, five times more likely um, to drop out, and three times more likely to have contact with our juvenile justice system. So we, we really, it is really imperative that we take a, a new tact here. We look at other ways that we can, in fact, um, resolve these issues and help our young people. Okay. So alternatives. So we're going to talk a lot about alternatives today in the context of the Local Control Accountability Plan. We're going to talk about alternatives that the research has shown uh, can keep schools safe, safe, but also hold our students accountable, right? They can increase academic achievement, actually, when we show that they're implemented and they're implemented effectively. Academic achievement rises for every young person in that building. You see overall academic gains. We also see an increase in school funding because attendance rates go up. Young people are more likely to come to school where the school climate is really strong and everyone's working together and they understand that the rules are fair and applied equally. Also, teachers are actually happier um, because teachers want to come to school and obviously you know, be able to teach and, and teach all their students. And so if they have support in keeping young people in the classroom and helping them, um, then we see also greater teacher stability um, and, oh, and overall, you know, climate, school climate and satisfaction as well. So I don't need to sh show you the data can show you too. These are, this is an example of Davidson Middle School where they have dropped their suspensions significantly um, after they implemented reforms including alternative justice and peer mediation courts. And at the same time that they did that, you see that the academic performance has gone up at that school for 
all groups. And you can see it for API for all, white, Latino, African American, so it's gone up all across the board. Similarly, Garfield High School in, in Los Angeles, where they've done extraordinary work with PBIS and a number of other alternative mechanisms, and basically said, you know, we're not suspending kids anymore. In fact, the punishment that these young people are going to get is they have to work with us more, and they have to be connected to our counselors, and they have to be connected to our parents, and they're going to stay with us. Um, and so you see when their suspensions went down, their API also went up. And Jed and Daya Smith uh, Elementary School also called the Teta Floyd. Um, similar, similar results that you see. And they, they have implemented not just um, PBIS, but social emotional learning. And um, so I've started to weave in restorative justice as well into their, their approach with young people. And this was a school that um, if you look on our website, you can find out about all three of these schools in much more detail. So I encourage everybody to go to fixschooldiscipline.org. Um, I'm going to say it multiple times, but there are is a huge toolkit there with lots and lots more resources. And almost everybody in there um, is, you'll see community organizers, educators, advocates, all talking about these real solutions being implemented in schools all across the state, including, you know, continuation schools and community day schools and big districts and small districts. And each of the folks who agreed to do an interview and really talk in detail about what they've done in their school sites and their districts is also willing to help. Um, and their phone numbers and their emails and everything are in there and the contacts are there's a whole contact list of trainers also inside those toolkits. So please visit fixschooldiscipline.org and you can find all those things. It's all free. Um, also we've heard from teachers. This is a, a teacher at a school in, in San Francisco where they're doing restorative practices or restorative justice and they say, she says, you know, the climate here is a lot be better. I see that there's less screaming and fighting from the kids and fewer frequent flyers. Um, you know, repeat students to the office, and she thinks that in part it was because students feel like their voices are being here. Um, one of the things also just to note, and we're not going to talk much about this today, but obviously another reason to do this is because the law says we should really focus on other means of correction, right? That suspension, including our supervised in-school suspension, can only be imposed when our other means of correction fail to bring about proper conduct. And this code section, which many of you know, 48900.5, has a, a list of all those kinds of things. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's a great list of some of the things you can do, and a number of them are discussed today. All right, so let's talk about school climate and the local control funding formula, right? Um, so we have here, um, we have here um, that four, there are four steps we're going to talk about, right? Um, and the four steps uh, we're going to go through today, the first, first one we're going to talk about is the um, creating a baseline of needs, okay? And then we're going to talk about setting goals, adopting specific actions, and also identifying expenditures. So for the first time again this year, the state law, um, Governor Brown's local control funding formula requires districts to create a local control accountability plan, the LCAP. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard this. We're going to try to get away from the acronyms, but I'm going to probably call it the LCAP at least once or twice, but it's the local control accountability plan. And there are eight state priorities that are the, should be the focuses, but only one of those state, one of, and one of those state priorities is school climate. Okay, and we're just going to focus on school climate. Districts need to look at all eight state priorities, and they can include other priorities, too, that they want in their local control accountability plans, right? And this is, again, it's going to be a whole budgeting process. So the new funding that's coming in from the state, and I know there's a mix out there in terms of whether some schools and districts are getting more funding and some are getting less, and we're not going to get into those specifics today, but, but the new plan will need to be created by July, and the budget and the plan will all be integrated. And today we're just going to focus on how do you meet that school climate priority, right? What are the ways you can do that? So again, four steps we're going to talk about. Creating a baseline needs assessment for school climate, setting goals for improving school climate and lowering, you know, and lowering our suspensions and ex expulsions, adopting specific actions, and identifying expenditures. So just briefly, this is a little picture of what this new funding system looks like. It's not comprehensive, but I just wanted to give some of you out there who are not as familiar. I know many of the folks who are from districts are very familiar with what this looks like, but we have a whole mix of people out there. So you can take a look. This slide just lets you know a little bit about what the new funding formula is going to do. So you've got a base funding rate, right? And that base funding rate is different depending on the grade levels, right? And this will be what the funding level should be once the funding plan is fully implemented. And then districts will also get a supplement 
um, and that's 20% of their base grant, and that will be for their low income, English learner, and foster youth students on duplicated counts. So you see there here, this is the amount of supplement that should be provided, right? So this the part of the local control funding formula obviously is about equity and ensuring that school districts that are serving young people who ha have higher needs are receiving this additional funding and that that funding is used to improve services for those young people. And then we have con a concentration grant as well where if 50% or more of those, you know, 55% of the students um, above that amount, districts that are serving that high of a percentage of students will also get an additional concentration grant. Okay, and how much will your district receive? Well, there are two online tools that I know about, um, which is EdSource, and you can click on there, and they actually have a feature that allows you to compare funding among districts. And then also WestEd, if you look on their website, they have um, a funding tool. Both of these are also links on our website online, so you can link from here or you can link from the website online. And then obviously if you're a community member and you don't know, um, you can ask your district, you know, and this is going to be a more public process. One of the goals of the local control funding formula is for there to be more engagement of parents and more integration of parents and community in the process of helping to establish what that plan looks like for the budget of your school and for the goals of your school. And so you can make, you can make a ask. You can either ask, you know, the district yourself, and there's some amazing people again on this call right now that I know would be happy to share that information if they have it. Um, and then you can also um, make an actual, if not, you can also make a Public Records Act request. And we have sample pub Public Record Act requests in our fixed school discipline toolkits online that you can also use. All right, so just so we understand what the process is, um, the process is the district's going to be developing proposed plan, and each district that I've been talking to is doing it a little bit different. Um, in LA, they've been holding a lot of meetings with community and town hall meetings and getting input from a variety of sources. The superintendent's been meeting with lots of people. I've heard from um, one of the, super, the superintendent of Azusa that she's been holding all sorts of coffee meetings with her teachers and educators and community members. I just heard last night from the superintendent of Vallejo that she's been doing a whole listening session where they've done polls of students and polls of parents and they're doing community forums. And those are all amazing ways to get parent input, right, to really engage the community and multiple levels. And, um, you know, the superintendent of Vallejo is saying that she's learning so much from these polls and from the, the surveys and everything that they're putting out that it's going to help them really shape not just the plan but the future of the district. So this is an opportunity to go above what the law requires, which I'll tell you in a moment, is you know, really to solicit written comments from the public, right? And then the district has to present the plan to a parent advisory committee. And then also if you have 15% or more um, of English language learners to your ELAC, your English language learner uh, advisory committee. And then you have to at least solicit recommendations and comments on the LCAP in one public hearing, okay? and respond in writing, obviously, to you know, those comments of, on, the, uh, on the PAC. So there's a, there's a specific minimum set of requirements in the, in the law, but there are, you know, what I'm hearing is a lot of creativity out there um, from different districts and school sites also about how to really engage parents, and I think that's really the intent of the law as well. All right, so we have this LCFF toolkit. This is, the PowerPoint is about that, but you can go online again to fixschooldiscipline.org and you can download it for free. It's got a lot more information. If there are things that are missing from our toolkit or things that you want, all you have to do at the end of this is you can email me or email Sarah in my office and we can, we can keep working on it and try to add more, um, more things that are not, you know, specifically addressed. All right? It's, it's all free. Everything on our, again, on our website is free. All right. So step one, we want to create a baseline and data um, of data and needs for each district. The things that are required by the law are the suspension and expulsion rates. And they need to be broken down by subgroups, so English language learners, foster youth, low-income students, right? And the law also talks about doing that by school in terms of to really get at what the full need looks like. Um, and then we, we suggest a few best practices. And that includes um, the number of in-school and out-of-school suspensions, having a specific category for willful defiance suspensions, you know, because we know that they make up such a huge uh, percentage of the suspensions um, in the state and for each district, so 43%, again, um, of the suspensions. And then the number of students suspended. You can find, the good thing is that now online, um, you can find almost all of that data 
on this link right here, which is CDE's website for DataQuest. So for community members that want to know about what those, those numbers look like, you can go directly there. And for districts, you, you all have submitted um, that data to the state and certified it's, that it's true. And so you can also, if it's hard to grab that data yourself, you can also pull down that data from the, from, um, from the state website. So anyway, we recommend having these sort of categories, at, at least as, as a minimum. Um, and this is just what DataQuest looks like for those of you who haven't gotten on it um, and used it before. And you can click on it, you'll see you go to the school level or the district level, and then the subject um, expulsion, suspension, and truancy. And you submit, and it will pull up the different sets of data. Other best practices that we would recommend if, if districts have that data available or are collecting it, teacher suspensions, office referrals and removals. Um, and the reason that we recommend that is because we're also looking at the amount of learning time lost. How, how many days, the, the correlation between the academic achievement, um, as one superintendent talked to me about, is it's not surprising that the academic achievement for my students when we reduce suspensions went down is because they're more often in class and they're learning, right? So, so teacher suspensions and office removals and referrals also add up to how much time is a child actually not in class and, and getting instruction. And then another thing to look at is a school climate survey. Um, California Healthy Kids School Climate Survey, there's a link right here. This, would, this is something that, you know, some kind of survey we would recommend because, you know, the data is just the data, right, in terms of it gives you the numbers. But in terms of finding out, well, what's really going on? What support do teachers need? What support do administrators need? What, what are the things that people think are missing? Um, you know, we recommend either, a, a, you know, a climate survey like California Healthy Kids or, you know, a few questions. So you can see here we've listed a few questions for teachers. You know, do you feel that you have sufficient training to help you manage your classroom? What kind of training would you like? What other support would you like, right? For students, what, what do you think would make your school safer? You know, help students in, 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 in your school not get in trouble. What resources or training do, do administrators need? So to get some feedback, more qualitative feedback and real sense of what's happening out there. Um, obviously, of course, with respect to the school to prison pipeline, you know, we would also recommend police referrals, arrests, and citations, um, because that is another way that, you know, in terms of where our young people are going and whether they're staying in class and in school or where, where, they're, where they're ending up, that's another data point that we think is important to collect around school climate. All right, so we have a hypothetical local control accountability plan here um, um, for folks to see, and I wish we were in person because this would be much more fun, so I'm sorry that we're not. Um, ABC school district, um, let's say this is some of the data, and in fact these data points are things that are from, I pulled them from different district data points. Um, so let's say the suspensions for willful defiance are 40% of all suspensions, right, and that, that, that school leaders have estimated that that's about 500 lost learning days per month. Um, African Americans in the district are 9% of the population, but they are 50% of overall suspensions. Foster youth are 12% of the population, but they're 30% of overall suspensions. Um, one of the high school we've looked, you know, the district took a deep dive and looked at all of the different schools and got a sense of it, and they found, you know, Apple High School seems to be having some trouble. They've got a suspension rate of 40%, and they've got 10 students being arrested per month. So there's something going on at, at one of the particular high schools. Um, they've got many, many teacher referrals. They started you know, collecting those for non-compliant behavior and that they're showing up as thousands per month. And the teachers are reporting in the school climate survey, you know, they're not getting any training on alternatives. They're, they're concerned about help with classroom management. They want extra support. And then the expulsions are 10% over the state rate and a number of them are for willful defiance. So this could be a picture that's painted in the LCAP um, in terms of uh, overall, some of the overall issues that remain in that district that the district could target in. And, and we focus on, I'm focusing on here in this, some of the tough things, right? Because when you're creating that baseline of data, then you're gonna set some goals to try to make improvements. And again, this is just hypothetical, okay? Um, the second step is, is setting goals, right? So the second step in creating the plan, um, um, is, is setting our goals, right? So we have examples for ABC school district again. This is just an idea, you know, that one of the things you could have very specifically is reducing the number of suspensions for nonviolent offenses, like by 10% or more per year. And we have districts um, that are working on right now doing that. They're setting very specific goals about what they want to do, and then they're putting specific actions in place um, 
for how they can address those issues, right? Um, we've seen in Los Angeles Unified that they have eliminated all suspensions for willful defiance. They did that outside of the LCAP process, but that could be something that as a policy change and something that you wanted to do to set a goal in your district. San Francisco Unified is also set to um, eliminate suspensions for willful defiance um, on the 25th. So next week they're going to be voting on that, that policy change. And we're hearing of other districts that are doing similar things are saying that they're going to put willful defiance suspensions as a real last resort. Um, we also have um, districts really looking closely at reducing disproportionality and suspensions for their African American students and setting some hard goals and putting in place you know, um, protections and really saying, we're going to keep reviewing that data and we want to make certain that it's in the LCAP. Um, it's a question, would you want to have a separate goal for Apple High School? Um, the law, you know, the law says, you know, that you just need one LCAP plan, one local control accountability plan. And when you go to fixschooldiscipline.org, you can also find the specific plan that was approved by the state board. So you can click through and you can find that plan. We have a, we're going to show you some samples of the type of information you could show. But if you want to see what the actual LCAP approved plan is by the state, we have that on our website. Um, there's, there's no requirement to do a separate goal for, for the schools, except we think that if, you know, th there are specific schools that need extra help and it would be helpful to give a goal, that's something that you can do um, and focus in on. Um, and also another idea for, for Apple ABC school district might be to, you know, reduce or eliminate those expulsions for non-mandatory offenses. And again, in LA and, and, and in San Francisco and Oakland and other places, they've been really looking at, all right, for our non-mandatory offenses, ones that we, we're saying are not things that are our highest level or zero tolerance offenses, what other kind of alternatives can we use for young people that would have otherwise been expelled from our district? What other kind of protections can we put in place for those young people um, that help keep them in school and on track, but that also, again, hold them accountable for the behavior and help them, you know, do better. All right, so this is this would be something that you could do for the setting goals section, right? Um, you could show the data here. We've got our baseline data, and this is just for one goal. And then here you've got some of the goals spelled out in a chart. And one of the things that's really important that when we've talked to community members about the LCAP that they're excited about, for those of you in school districts, is for them to be able to understand better this process and for them to understand, you know, more clearly what happens and what are the goals of the district and what, what, are, what is everybody working together because they also want to work with you and try to make those things happen. So making it as transparent as possible is an important, important piece of this. All right, the third step, taking your specific action. So we looked at our baseline data and then we looked at our goals and now the question is what are going to be the specific actions that we're going to take? And um, these are just some ideas, okay? So, um, you know, we really like to focus on things that are research-based in terms of alternatives. And also, if you look in 48900.5, these are some of the things that are listed as, as alternatives. So positive behavior interventions and supports. I'm, I know a number of you are already implementing school-wide positive behavior interventions and supports in your schools or have been thinking about or talking to people about it. Um, restorative justice or restorative practices. Um, Programs teaching pro-social behavior or anger management, right? Peer mediation, again, Davidson Middle School is doing some really interesting things around that. And then other alternatives. There are others such as, you know, meeting with parents and, you know, getting young people um, to, you know, mental health therapy, ensuring that there are tiered interventions that get them to higher levels of, of assistance, okay? And so in, in this part of the LCAP, you're identifying what are the specific actions you're going to take to reach those goals that you've set for? Also, what kind of training are you going to provide to help increase the ability of teachers, administrators, and other staff to provide support to students who are struggling with behavior, right, and issues to reduce disparities? Are the actions that you're thinking about, are these district-wide actions or school-wide actions? Are there certain schools that you want to put more attention on that need additional help? Is there a reason why you might take specific actions maybe around school climate in your high schools and middle schools, right, because that's where the, the, the biggest issues are, so you put more emphasis on goals in those areas. And, you know, what about particular subgroups, right? So if you're seeing, for example, that your foster youth are really being disproportionately suspended and that their academic achievement outcomes are also showing up as very low, are there particular goals that you would set with that for, that, for those subgroups? Um, or, you know, uh, for your English language learner students, are there particular goals for a specific subgroup? And then, you know, another question is not everything here is something that necessarily has to cost, you know, cost money, right? Are there policy changes 
that you want to work on um, that can meet these goals. All right. Um, so some of the some of the we're just going to focus in on some of the specific actions just really quickly for those on the call that are not as familiar and really want to get into the meat of, of what some of these things might look like at a school site in a community. So some of the, the primary ones that are research based are restorative justice, restorative practices, right? Social emotional learning, school wide positive behavior interventions and supports, trauma sensitive or trauma informed schools. And then more recently, a real focus people have been really focusing on, and, and we've had a number, we have another webinar coming up in March about this, so I won't talk too much about this, but implicit and explicit bias training. So getting at some of the disproportionality, and we've been extremely impressed by the number of people interested in this and wanting to bring this into their schools and wanting to address um, the disproportionality and suspensions head on and saying, you know, we have to have these difficult conversations and figure out what's going on. So restorative practices. You know, for those of you that are familiar with it and are doing it, you'll, this will sound very familiar to you. Um, but, you know, tr the traditional focus, right, our traditional approach is that school rules are broken. We look and find out who establishes guilt. And as a lawyer, I know we do this all the time too, right? And then we, we figure out how are we going to punish that person, right? How are we going to punish the student? And really the rules are really outweighing whether that outcome in terms of what happens to the person who is punished is, is, out, is positive or ne negative. And the victim is largely not usually a huge part of the process, right? And there's, there's kind of this limited opportunity for trying to make amends or bring people back together. And the restorative approach is really a recognition that people and relationships are being harmed, right? That, um, that, that we need to all be accountable for, and the person who has, has done the harm needs to be accountable for understanding the impact and repairing that harm. And that everybody has a role in that process because we need to heal whatever has, has resulted from, from, the, from what has taken place, right? So that the offender and the victim and the school all have roles in helping to recreate that process and create a better school, school climate, right? And the offender is responsible for the harmful behavior, but also for working towards a positive outcome. So, and they, they have this opportunity to actually make amend, express their remorse, and actually be brought back in to the school community, which to me is one of the, the huge things, because I often am the one representing the young people in schools who, who have done some harm or have been accused of doing some harm. And they all actually really want to be able to make amends. They want to be able to come back into that school community. They want to be forgiven, and they want to figure out how they can, how they can become part of the process. So restorative practices and restorative approach justice is an approach that's not just about each individual instance, but it's also about changing school climate and culture. Um, and right below there, you'll see that there are a couple quick resources um, that you can go to at, for your school site or if you're advocating the community, you can reach out to these folks and look on these sites. And also, again, in fixschooldiscipline.org, we have lots of interviews of folks, how they're implementing, what it looks like on the ground, what works, what didn't work. And you can, you can actually call them and talk to them directly. A number of them now are doing trainings in different parts of the state for for districts and linking up, and we hope over time that as more and more schools begin doing this kind of work and seeing the changes, that we'll be able to create more and more networks and build the number of trainers out there that are that are doing this work. Another another um, another evidence based alternative is social emotional learning, um, and this is really a, um, a process about direct instruction uh, around recognizing that not everybody has, uh, not all of our students have, but need, right, to be able to acquire and effectively apply skills for recognizing and managing their emotions, developing caring and concern for others, making responsible decisions, all these things, handling challenging situations. And this is actually a proactive curriculum that's woven into the school day and is a part of, can be a part of the school site learning. And um, one of the SEL approaches, which is called positive action, um, just to give you a sense, it costs about 7000 for materials for a four, 500 student school. That's sort of the, the price. And that, um, that one of the studies that followed this um, over time, uh, you know, and, and involved trainers in their school site found that it reduced disruptive behaviors by 72 percent, suspensions by 24 percent, and then another study in another school found that it reduced the suspensions around 73 percent and that grade retention increased 
I mean, grade, grade progress increased by 73%. So you can take a look on, on um, CASEL's website, and they actually have some funding um, to do this for free, and there are other schools that have been trained um, that are doing this work around social emotional learning. All right, school-wide positive behavior intervention support, another intervention that probably many of you know about. The idea of, of um, SWPBIS is to actually have a structure in place at your school site, a tiered structure that looks at the different needs of young people who are struggling with behavior. Um, you, you know, starting from a you know, sort of a triangle at the bottom of that triangle, um, uh, that you, you know, at the bottom of the triangle is most of our young people who really just need, uh, you know, proactive instruction, right? Proactive instruction on how to behave positive, you know, what, what, what ways do we interact in the classroom, those kind of things. And then a tiered structure within school where if you have young people who have much higher level needs, if they get to someone quickly and they get to the support that they need, positive support, mental health support, counseling, intervention with teachers and parents. Um, and then sometimes in some school districts that I've seen, this, the larger central district also has like an intensive intervention program for those young people and they reach out and they help the school sites. So you have a real tiered intervention program and you also have a set of rules that are really clear and specific and everybody knows them on campus. It's four or five rules at most and everybody is focused on you know, applying them in different settings and, and everybody's working together as a team. So basically the idea is that if you actively teach and acknowledge expected behaviors all the time and everybody in your school site is doing it together, that you can change the extent to which students expect appropriate behavior from themselves and others. A couple of you are asking, will you get a copy of the PowerPoint and all the links? And yes, I'm going to send that out. And also, this is being recorded. So we're going to have it online so you can share it with your colleagues. Um, and again, if you go to fixschooldiscipline.org, these are some of the, this is some of the data and research. But if you go to fixschooldiscipline.org and you actually download the toolkit, the toolkits that are there, they're not that long. One's 13 pages. One is about six or seven pages. It has all of this and more. Um, the, our huge toolkit is about 70 pages, um, but and it has all the interviews and everything. But almost all of this is here, and there's a lot more. This is just a snippet of what you can get in the toolkit. So again, on this, this slide, you can see these are all links to re various resources throughout the state and throughout the nation um, for P PBIS, right? And one thing I want to let all the districts folks out there know, remember, you can use your special education funding to do this for your entire school site and your district. This is kind of a secret that I think not everybody knows, but you know there is a provision in, in the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act that says you can use a certain percentage of funding to ensure school-wide positive behavior interventions and supports throughout your school site and throughout your district. And a number of your county offices of education have been trained on this, have used some of their idea funding to actually have really good trainers internally um, who can help, and sometimes they'll come out and do trainings for districts for free or very low cost. Um, and one of the, um, we'll talk about it in a second, but one of the schools that implemented this, Pioneer Middle School, they have, over time, they now don't need any training. They had two or three years of, of training, and they work with their county office of education, and they've seen $100,000 increases in the um, ADA funding that's coming into their district because they've improved their attendance as a result of the work they've done on school climate. Trauma-sensitive schools. Um, the approach of trauma-sensitive schools, right, is really this the idea of, of something that's becoming we're knowing more and more, right, is that most of our children who are causing the most problems in our school are really have been traumatized. They've been traumatized multiple times. Um, most of my clients, um, when I started looking at their records, you know, they've witnessed domestic violence. They've seen shootings on their streets. They themselves have been subjected to abuse and ne neglect. Um, our young people who are crying out and causing problems are often our most traumatized. And so this approach really recognizes that this exposure to trauma actually it not only causes pain, which we all know, but it actually it affects a child's ability to self-regulate emotions and, and to, to have you know, effective executive functioning, right? And what that means is that it's what we see in our classrooms, right? That sometimes our young people can't stay still, they can't focus, they they are in a fight or flight response at all times. So they will take something that's not actually a threat to them and because of where they are in terms of you know, the trauma they've experienced, that they will automatically re react. And so this is a way of actually helping to address the behavioral needs of those students in a proactive manner so that they are able to, in fact, learn 
in our classroom and supporting our teachers and our schools and, and getting to that. And so these, you can see here there are some resources around um, doing that and more and more folks are starting to do this. It's being also done in the child welfare context. But again, our traditional response, the punishment, right, of removing a child from class and from school, it really re reinforces that trauma. So we are we're adding stress, we're con contributing to disengagement, and we're really sending that message again that you're not wanted to a young person who's already, you know, experienced a lot of trauma and, and sort of rejection um, pretty early on. So, and then finally, implicit and explicit bias training. Uh, again, this is for, you know, schools where you're seeing disproportionate suspension rates, and you're starting to ask the question, well, why is this happening, you know? Um, the research shows for African American students, and there's been several studies, but that that there aren't the behaviors, it's not about the behaviors in terms of they've correlated and they've tested and they've pulled things out to say that, you know, it's not that there are higher level of behaviors. So there's other factors here that are, are going into why we have disproportionate rates of for our young people um, of color, particular African American students. And so some of the really interesting new good research that's coming out is showing that when they have honed in on in schools on strategies such as home visits, increasing parent and school staff connections, so really creating, again, building relationships, that that has been shown to reduce disparities. That actual personal connection and those relationships have resulted in, 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 in less in terms of disparities. Um, there's a really wonderful training on our website, again, free, fixschooldiscipline.org, toolkit, webinar, archive, and you can check out. It's by Tia Martinez. Um, she's from the UCLA Civil Rights Project, and we're going to have uh, Rita uh, Wedding is going to do another training um, in March. She's fantastic. I saw her, and she, she'll be. It'll be a free training just on this explicit, explicit and implicit bias. And she's a professor, um, has done a lot of work in this area, and she also provides um, free trainings and other trainings to school sites. All right. Some other policy change ideas. Some of you are saying, "Oh, money. We don't have the money for all this. What are we going to do?" Um, again, I would say, you know. We should prioritize this and we should find, find the resources for, for this because this is fundamental. But some other things that you can do, um, you can work on a discipline matrix with community members of alter, alternative discipline measures, right, to document and use prior to suspension. You could um, eliminate suspensions for willful defiance. You can do training on implicit bias. Once you've, done, you know, once you've gotten some of the trainings off our website, you can, you can work, on, work on doing that and figuring out how we really start talking about that. Um, you could do an alternative process for uh, non-mandatory expulsion, something you can create internally and use state money for. Um, you can document and track alternatives to suspension. Um, we're a number of districts, um, including Pasadena Unified, San Francisco, Oakland, um, others are working on memorandum of understanding um, between their police officers in their neighborhood and um, also on, you know, uh, and, and, and the role of police and uh, on campus. So really establishing those rules so that school dis discipline is really addressed by school administrators so we can reduce the number of our young people being arrested and going to the juvenile justice system. Um, stopping citations and arrests for our middle and elementary school students. We've seen, we've seen that work being done in, in LA. We've seen it being, work, being looked at in other places around the state. And, you know, increasing diversion and stopping citations and arrests for low-level offenses. These are things that we can all do, um, you know, that districts can do through policy change. So again, here's a little sample for you. So we're putting it all together, right? This is the, now we've got the, our basic need, we've got our goal, and then we've got a specific action, right? So here, just a, you know, sample of a specific action, implementing school-wide positive behavior interventions and support in our schools with our highest rates of suspension, um, eliminating willful defiance suspensions for African-American students, really looking at our schools with the highest rates of African-American students suspended, and implementing restorative practices, um, conducting training on implicit bias, requiring dialogue with districts prior to suspension for non-dangerous offenses to really figure out what other resources and supports that school site might need. So these are just some ideas. And um, San Francisco is actually looking at all three of these right now in the policy that they are um, looking at passing and approving next week. All right, the last thing. It's all about the LCAP as a part of the budget, so we've got to identify our expenditures. Um, and the, the law says, list the amount of money for each of your specific actions, and then also um, identify how that supplemental funding, right, and concentration funding is going to be used to increase or improve services for our English language learners, our low-income students, and our foster youth. There's three specific groups 
that are the equity groups that the governor carved out for and really is putting emphasis on in this new budget formula. And we say best practices also would be, you know, identify the amount of money you're looking at for your school climate goals. So for this priority area, really let the community know and community should advocate for, you know, what is that school climate goal? What are, what, what's the priority going to look like and what kind of funding? And how are you going to use additional resources for um, the ELL, low income and foster youth on school climate goals for those students specifically, right? So, so we would say, you know, you, you need to identify how you're going to use the supplemental and concentration funding overall to improve services or increase or improve services. But it would be great to also identify that on the school climate goals. Um, and then the question always is, how much money is enough? Um, and I'm not going to go into detail, but in the LCFF toolkit online, we talk about just some of the examples um, of what school, other school districts and school sites have said in terms about what, how much money is needed. And what I would recommend, though, is that for each school site and district, when you do that needs analysis, and as a community member, if you're advocating for this, figure out what you think the needs are. Everybody work together to think about that. And then start talking to some of these trainers and others who are working on this. Talk to other school sites in your area, which you can find in the back of the contact list, and ask them what they, they what it costs for them and what they would recommend because you know people are really learning this this um, how to implement these things and because this the implementation of these things in California has only been happening you know for the last few years um, and different districts and schools are getting online at different times we're building that practice community right we're building the knowledge about cost um, and some of these things are actually free or very low cost so. So, you know, take a look and you'll see more on our website about that. All right, so here's, here's an example um, of how you might list your expenditures for just the goal um, related to eliminating out-of-school suspensions um, and the, our specific actions, right? So we talked about base funding. Um, you'd use your base funding $150,000 per year for implementation in 10 schools. You might have to spend some money on putting together an MOU for training around SWPBIS. Um, in terms of for restorative practices implementation, you know, 210,000 per year um, in five schools. That would be one of the recommendations from one of the trainers and, and folk, a school district who's done this says, you know, you want to hire and fully train one district-wide restorative practice coach and then possibly, you know, two school-specific coaches who can work at multiple schools. Um, some money for implicit bias training, and then you have some supplemental funding here to specifically look at our African-American students who are low income. So this would break out, uh, it's just an example of how you might break out the supplemental funding. Okay, and then in the toolkit again, if you go online, you'll find there's other funding sources. Again, the LCAP is a part of your overall budget in your district, and so, you know, you, it's not just the base funding and the supplemental and concentration, but it's all of the other funding sources. So what other funding sources are there? And we, we've identified um, a number of funding sources on our website that you can go to and look at, and also, you know, potential sources for grants. You know, some of the incredible districts, Vallejo has brought in a lot of grant funding around there, so there's a lot of different funders that are very interested in school climate and helping and supporting um, schools and doing this work. So it's, you know, good to reach out and see about making that happen, too. Um, again, I just want to say, you move away from removing kids, you can also increase your funding. Again, Pioneer High School in Woodland, they generated about 100000 in savings um, because of the increases in attendance. All right, here are some additional resources for you. Um, more and more resources. More, if you have more questions on LCFF, obviously we're not talking about all of it, but here's a lot of uh, uh, other resources where you can find more. Um, also, U.S. Department of Education guidelines. Um, they just came out, the Department of Education um, and Justice just came out with guidelines um, for um, implementing alternatives to discipline, and they have a real focus on that, and they have a huge toolkit kind of thing also with lots of resources. So it's another great place um, to look at in your community and in your school district. And then here you can see more um, um, on Children Now's website. They have a number of great resources as well. Again, fixschooldiscipline.org, here's a lot of the things you can get, sharing best practices, webinars, um, examples from educators and principals, making it work, and tools you can use. And you can reach out to Sarah Mojula, who is our amazing uh, education advocate and former teacher, who can provide technical assistance and help guide you to those people who can also support your work um, and support your community's work in doing this. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jasmine and um, ask Jasmine to 
give us a little information about um, what they're doing in Oakland um, with a real specific example. I have to find Jasmine to turn her on. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead, Jasmine. You are now live. Okay, awesome. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jasmine with the Black Organizing Project. I'm a community organizer here, um, and I've been here with, for, for the last four years, and I'm so honored to be sharing the word pop is doing locally in Oakland um, with many of the experts that are currently on the uh, line today. Um, and I come before you very humbly and hope that we um, are able to impart how grassroots organizations are engaging with um, the local control, local control funding formula and the local uh, control accountability plan. So I wanted to, before we kind of get into the work Bob is doing on the ground, um, I wanted to give everyone an idea of kind of why we exist and what we are trying to achieve. Um, so the Black Organizing Project is a black member-led grassroots community organization working for social, racial, and economic justice in Oakland, California. Our vision is to build a strong bottom-up organization of black people that will craft alternative models and institutions that will advance our vision of racial and economic justice, rebuild the spirit and foundation of our community, exercise political and economic power, act to win real systemic change, transform the lives of black people, and embody the spirit that has sustained the black community. And we can go to the next slide. So um, we were founded in November of 2009. We had our first official membership meeting in March of 2010. Um, between 2010 and 2011, we held several listening sessions all throughout Oakland to hear from the community as far as what they thought um, the, the major issues that were impacting the black community. Um, and the issue areas that came out were jobs, the fact that people, black people were not able to get jobs or they had um, low-wage jobs. Um, also violence that were perpetuated both by people in the community and also law enforcement. Um, education, the fact that um, our students were dropping out at high rates and were not going to college. Um, and that there were high mental health issues within the community and a lot of internalized oppression. Um, after researching more about you know how we can take some action around some of these things that came out, um, we lost our, we launched our first campaign in October in 2011. Um, and the name of that campaign is Bettering Our School System Off. Um, after that, we organized um, the community to um, engage around a school police complaint policy, um, which allows for students, community, and parents to. Um, express if they experienced any harm from law enforcement or school police on campuses. Um, in August of 2013, we released a report about over-policing youth and how it impacts um, black youth most. And we did that in partnership with Public Council and ACLU Northern California. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so a little bit more about our campaign. Um, in October of 2011, we launched our BOSS campaign. And our target, our target is the Open Unified School District. And the purpose of this campaign is really to create transparency and full accountability of the Oakland School Police Department and guarantee the physical, emotional, and educational safety of Oakland public youth. Um, and so we, we came to this campaign because in January of 2011, one of our members informed the membership of the fatal officer involved shooting. Um, there was a young man by the name of Raheem Brown that was killed at the hands of a school police officer. As we discussed this amongst our membership, several questions arise for us. Um, like, why do we have school police? And what are they doing on our campuses? And how much money are we spending on school police as we are closing down schools? Um, and what are, there, what are some alternatives to school police? Um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, and so while we um, were asking these questions amongst ourselves, we decided that we needed to also ask students and parents and community um, what they're noticing on their campuses and you know how they felt about um, police and police interactions that are happening on our campuses. Um, and so we wanted to get a feel of how students perceive police and whether or not they believe in alternatives. Um, and when we asked if they liked the presence of police on their school campuses, an overwhelming majority, if you see here, 62.4% of the students um, 
said that they did not like police on their campuses. And when we asked if uh, they thought, um, or when we asked what they think would make them feel safer on campuses, many of the students replied that, you know, having better trained security guards or more extracurricular activities and programs would make them feel safe and um, give them the space to have voice. We also asked them if they believed in alternatives. And so um, a large majority of them also said yes, they believe there are alternatives to having law enforcement um, and school police on campuses. And this is a list of some of the things that came out. Um, you know, things like peer courts, teen conflict groups, parent involvement, community involvement, um, meditation, um, anger management classes, yoga, um, security guards that understand the police, I mean, sorry, security guards that understand the students, um, art, and things like violence awareness classes. Um, and these are some of the things that the students actually suggested that could serve as alternatives to law enforcement to school. After we surveyed um, the youth and the students um, and the parents, um, we partnered with Public Council and ACLU to submit a Public Records Act request to gather data around police contact with OUSD youth. Um, and this graph right here gives you an overview of the enrollment of students broken down by race. Um, and the three agencies that we collect the data from are the OUSD School Police Department, the Oakland Police Department, and the Alameda County Probation Department. Um, and we used this data that we collected to release our report last year. And you can read more about our joint report um, on our website, which is www.blackorganizingproject.org. Um, now, this slide that you currently are looking at shows the school police contact with youth. Um, and you can clearly see that there is a huge disproportionality um, in contact for African American youth, or contact with law enforcement and African American youth. Um, this shows that for the years between 2010 and 2011, in 2011 and 2012, black youth made up 30.5% of the OUSD population, but 73% of OUSD school police arrests. And during that same period, there was not one single arrest of a white student. And so this clearly shows that um, there is a huge disproportionate arrest rate in contact with law enforcement for African Americans. Um, we also gathered data from the Oakland Police Department. Um, and we saw the same similar disproportionality in contact with OPD in black youth. Um, and over a seven-year period, black youth were on average 73.5% 73 of all juvenile arrests by OPD. And each year, even um, though they only made up 29.3% of the Oakland youth population, and that's according to the 2010 census data. Um, we also found that black youth were referred to Alameda County Probation, De a probation Department at more than two and a half times their percentage in the population. And so what this means is that black youth are six times more likely than a Hispanic youth and 23 times more likely than a white youth to be arrested and referred to Alameda County Probation Department. Um, and so I'm sure everyone is wondering why does this matter and, you know, what does this have to do with me? Um, and this matters because we are noticing a disturbing trend of school push out and it's impacting youth of color the most. And Laura noted earlier that the more students are out of school um, because of suspensions and expulsions, um, the more likely they are to repeat a grade to drop out or come into contact with the juvenile justice system. So what's next? Um, you know, what people are doing on the ground and locally um, is different for each organization. Um, but what Bob is doing next, um, over the next month, we'll be collecting and analyzing data um, to form a position around what we'd like to see reflected in the local control accountability plan. Um, and currently, stop, um, and we want to see those things as it relates to school climate. So Laura mentioned earlier that we are in the process of developing a template that lays out the needs um, and also sets some goals and to also identify actions um, that the district can take and funding streams um, to make sure those action steps can be actualized. 
Um, and we are currently working with um, the district on some internal policies that clearly outlines the role of police and also limits their role in school discipline. This is an example of policies and actions that a district is taking to reduce contact with law enforcement. And Bob would like to continue to see the district move in a direction that prioritizes investing in alternatives. Um, and um, this is how we plan on doing this. So groups all around Oakland um, locally have been working on the local control funding formula for some years. And now that it's passed, it's very important that all stakeholders are at the table um, and involved in setting priorities. And one of the things that we would like to see prioritized in the local control accountability plan is we don't want any additional funding to go in law enforcement. We're very clear that um, having police on campuses is not creating um, safe environments that are keeping kids in school and putting them on the track to graduate. So we want to make sure that we're putting a moratorium on funding for police in schools. We also want the district to prioritize eliminating disproportionality in school discipline um, and also law enforcement contact. So, you know, eliminating willful defiance and um, limiting the role of police and if by any means possible, eliminating police on school campuses um, will really help in seeking that um, we, we decrease disproportionality. Um, we also want to see a greater investment in alternatives. And so Laura mentioned many of them in detail, but um, things like restorative justice practices and positive behavior interventions and support, social emotional learning are the things that we want to see more investment in to really create a climate that students are um, feel like they are cared for and that they are able to learn. Um, we also would like to see more professional development for teachers. Um, and we want to um, we want the district to prioritize real parent and youth engagement beyond the local school site governing bodies. Um, because as we've um, recently seen and noticed within the district, um, they're not functioning. The local school site bodies like um, school site councils or the district advisory council, um, they're not functioning at a, a level that everyone is engaging. And so we definitely want to see the district um, prioritize getting those functioning bodies together, but we also want to see um, greater um, engagement outside of um, the school sites and allowing for parents and community um, and students to engage even outside of school site bodies. Um, next month, we also will be releasing a policy brief in partnership with Labor Community Strategy Center that um, lays out the rationale for using local control funding formula to deprioritize de school policing and then invest in alternatives. And so these, these are some of the things that BOP is currently doing to ensure that um, the district is making sure that they are having parent involvement, that there is student engagement, and that they are changing the school climate. And these are a couple of the priorities that are outlined in the local control accountability. Can I add, um, can you can you let people know your email address just in case they want to ch check in with you or talk with you? Yes, yes, please. Um, my email address is jasmine, my first name, J, A as in Apple, S, M as in Mary, I, N as in Nancy, E, at blackorganizingproject.org, so the name of the organization. Great. And um, I just wanted to, I, there was a comment from, there were a couple comments. If you, anybody has any questions now, we're going to open it up for questions. We have, you know, a good 15, 20 minutes here for folks that want to stay on and ask questions. Um, one of the things that Roxana um, Marachi, excuse me, excuse me if I didn't say your name correctly, um, wanted to mention to folks is that uh, Strategies for Youth um, works actually with police agencies to address disproportionality in, in arrests with an emphasis on training about adolescent needs and youth development. Um, I've, I've, they do wonderful work. I actually saw them too, do two sessions at the Keeping Kids in School conference um, that was held recently by the um, State Bar and others. And um, they're also uh, part of the Juvenile Justice Information Network. And they are, um, they're, you know, they're a training resource. Um, and we don't have them currently listed in our toolkit, but we will we will see about putting them in our online version of the toolkit so that that's another resource around this for folks. Thank you for that comment.
Do others have any questions or comments? Feel free to send them by email. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and uh, Susan uh, Swope wanted to say, you know, that um, she wanted to make certain that it's really clear that, of course, Oakland has been doing a lot of initiatives, including RJ, um, and that have been going on for the last three years um, and under the VRP and otherwise. And if you go to fixschooldiscipline.org again, there's actually a whole section on Oakland Unified. Um, David Usum, a sort of justice for Oakland youth is mentioned. There's a description of, of all of the work they've been doing. There's a description of the resolution, the RJ resolution that was passed um, that RJ pushed and worked with uh, uh, board members on. And there's also um, the voluntary resolution agreement that's um, on board plan that was passed in Oakland is also online for people to see as another policy change. Obviously that one was done with the Office for Civil Rights um, and has been being monitored, but it has a lot of really great language about ways that you can put in place alternatives and, and transform systems. So thanks for that comment, Susan, and you can find out more about them. Um, Beatrice um, Leva Cutler wanted to ask, how in particular are you working to support homeless youth? So um, that's a really great question. Um, most of the strategies that we're talking about here um, are going to help homeless youth um, because they are relationship building strategies and, and at least with young, young people that I've worked with that are homeless um, in particular, um, that relationship building is critical because many of the young people I've worked with have been, I had one young woman who was kicked out because she wouldn't wear a uniform but she was living in a car, didn't have a uniform, all, all those kinds of things. But if building those relationships and, and putting in place alternatives, we can find out what those problems are and solve them. Um, I know a number of the, the, the legislation itself focuses on foster youth in terms of supplemental and concentration grants. And many of our homeless youth also, um, some of our homeless youth also qualify under the foster youth category. Um, but in particular, you know, these strategies are ones that apply for all youth, um, but they're, they're not particular to homeless youth. So I think it's a great question to, to think about when you're looking at alternative discipline, are there other ways that um, for homeless youth we should be more strategic in thinking about their specific needs? Um, and obviously um, there are, there's federal law that protects the rights of homeless youth not to be excluded or segregated from their schools and would really support full inclusion of homeless youth and making certain that their needs with respect to transportation and <clears throat> extra resources are taken into account. Um, and uh, Susan Swope also wanted to ask uh, uh, Jasmine, Jasmine, what um, she wanted to know, what are you all doing in terms of your working with RJOY um, and other groups um, around the issues that you raised? Um, so the Black Organizing Project, um, we actually are the anchor organization for a coalition called Dignity in Schools Bay Area Chapter. Um, and so we're having conversations with some of the organizations that are doing work on the ground as well as folks like Public Council and um, Children's, Defense, Children's Defense Fund and Policy Link um, in ACLU Northern California as far as how do we leverage our work um, through the local control accountability plan. Um, additionally, we um, are part of another um, coalition locally um, with OCO, um, which is Oakland Community Organizations, APAL, um, Californians for Justice, Youth Together. Um, I may be forgetting someone that I can't think of plan, um, Parent Leadership Action Network, um, who are all also having conversations around how you make sure that um, we are prioritizing um, the needs of the students that are most impacted by um, school climate issues. And so we're working locally with other groups to figure out how do we collaborate and make sure that we're all in one accord when we are putting together our demands and our priorities and presenting them to the district. Great. And uh, Beatrice um, Leva Cutler also, who I think had the same question about homeless youth, um, made a great suggestion with respect to homeless youth to really think about regional work and regional strategies. Um, which I think is exactly right for and for foster youth too who cross borders in cities and school districts. Two things on that. One is that the our county offices of education will also be creating local control accountability plans. Um, and we have some I have some slides on that that I can send out if people would like them um, that just talk about what the county offices are doing. But I think that's a that's a way to regionalize some of this work in terms of the county offices taking a role and trying to fill some of those gaps and helping 
helping those plans work together. The county offices are also supposed to review the plans. And so I think the strategies for foster youth um, will be key to look at what, what those are and how maybe they relate um, to strategies for homeless youth. And public council has been working in LA with a huge collaborative group that includes child welfare and folk foster youth liaisons and um, all sorts of um, people. And they've created, we're, we're in the process with this huge collaborative of creating kind of a sample of some of the strategies for LCAP that could be used to really meet those new needs around foster youth. And it would not just be for school climate, but other things. And so if folks are interested in that, you can email me and I can send you what that looks like. I think they're finalizing it sometime this week or next week. And it's something that could be used in other districts around the state. Um, Nikki Bomrind asks, if I understood correctly, federal education code allows schools to refuse to allow students to make up exams or homework they missed while suspended. Um, that's not true. I don't know of anything in federal education code that allows for that specifically. Um, I'm, I've been trying, I've been thinking about that as you asked the question. I'll have to look back. But um, I don't think it, it doesn't actually address the issue. Our state code does not specifically require that when a student is suspended that they are allowed to make up those things. So I think actually it's interesting. There is, I think, a bill, at least there was consideration of, of a bill to, to look at this, to make certain that young people who are suspended would have an opportunity to make up mix, missed work. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, what, uh, what status it's in now, but yes, there was, a, there was a legislator this year who was actually looking into that specific issue. And so if you want to email me, if you're interested in more of that, Nikki, if you want to email me, hopefully I can connect you with the, the legislative office and see where they are. Um, uh, David uh, Hoffman asks, if the LCAP parent advisory disagrees with the district's ultimate budget decisions, what remedies do they have? Um, really, not, there's not a specific remedy for that um, in the, in the um, <clears throat> process. It's an idea for review and comment. Um, but David, uh, you and I can send you the specific code sections around parent involvement in the process around that, since it's a bit of a broader, broader question, and you can take a look at them themselves. Um, I ha there's a we have a two or three pager um, that children now created with all the legal requirements. And in addition, if you go to some of those resources that I sent, you can get a lot more information on the overall LCAP process. All those links give you lots and lots of details, and in addition, if you go to fixschooldiscipline.org and you're downloading our two LCFF toolkits, you'll also see that there's the link to the new temporary regulations passed by the Department of Education, and you can, again, download that information. Um, Nikki says that she believes that the right to a free public education is temporarily suspended during suspension. Um, no. It's a little more complicated than that. And Nikki, why don't you and I, let me, let me make sure I want to get to the, the answer to your question so that we can, I can be helpful in terms of if there's a specific situation you're thinking of. Um, I shot to Yusef. Yusef? Um, yes, that's right. Um, how is the LCFF being evaluated and when will the evaluation start? Um, after two years is the question. So. Um, the LCFF, uh, the local control accountability plans are approved, have to be approved through a county office of education process. And the plan this year is really important because, that everybody get involved and really, you know, think this through and really do their very best efforts because it's a three-year plan, but it is updated annually. So this is a really important time for everyone to put their heads together and create the best plans um, for their districts and their communities. And again, I will send out with this PowerPoint the um, sort of longer summary of LCFF and LCAP so you can see the process for approval um, if you're interested in more of the nuts and bolts of the overall LCFF process. Um, any other? I'm sorry, I'm trying to scroll down. Okay. All right, so there's a question of Yes, there's a real, there's a, uh, Roxana mentions a really important issue around charter schools, um, uh, that charter schools uh, in California, you know, actually have significant disproportionality with respect to suspension and their school push out, and this is a real issue. 
Um, she says, I've read of rates up to 72 times higher suspension rates in DC charter schools. Any, any ideas around this? Um, and do any, anyone else have uh, information about this issue locally or statewide? So you can actually find information on charter schools online. We've been crunching some of the data um, in LA because it is actually the charter school rates are fairly high. Um, and so you can find out information about charter schools. And um, it is of concern. Um, I think uh, we have districts, school districts that are also very concerned about this issue because they will often get a call, um, you know, that uh, someone has been pushed out of one of the charter schools and then they have to figure out what to do. Um, and the process through, through which those trans, you know, the removals happen is um, not, not applied with full due process. Um, so this is something that folks are looking at. In LA, the school climate bill of the, the school climate bill of rights includes a provision that those sections of the school climate bill of rights should be applied to charter schools. And I think um, Los Angeles Unified is working on how they do that and what that looks like with respect to the um, application process for charter schools in the district and what processes are there to ensure that you know again charter schools need to follow federal law. And so, to the extent that we are seeing um, discrimination in application of suspension policies, it's something that, that can and, and should be addressed. Um, do, Jasmine, do you have any other thoughts on that issue about charter schools that you want to share? Um, actually, yeah, I, I don't. Um, any other questions? These are great questions, folks. Does anybody have any other ones before we, before we jump off? Thank you all for being so engaged. I'm hoping I didn't miss any. Okay, so this is um, recorded again. This The presentation's been recorded. And so we will actually be sending a link out in a few days to all of you and to those that weren't able to make it but signed up so that you can, in fact, um, share it and give it to other people and review it or however you want to use it. Um, and we will also send out the PowerPoint presentation and I will send out those additional resources. But again, go to fixschooldiscipline.org. It's super easy. You can link on it right now. You can actually pull off the guides and the toolkits right from our website. They are all free. They're easy to download. You can use them however you want. Please, you know, distribute them as far as you can. Take whichever pieces are useful to you and go to the big toolkits also because there are a lot of additional contact organizations and resources and training materials and all sorts of things in there that you can use in your communities and your districts today. Um, and thank you all so much for participating. We really appreciate it.